good morning, everyone. So I will start this session. Uh, to, this morning, we're going to have our parallel session on aphasia and acquired communication difficulties. My name is Caroline Bagnall. I'm from the RCSLT. I'm research manager. And today we'll hear from each of our great presenters in turn, and then we'll take questions at the end. Now, everyone's microphone participant wise is muted. So if you've got any questions, just pop them in the Q&A box. And at the end, I'll go to them and um, see if we can ask some of our questions to our presenters today. If there's a question that somebody's already asked you, asked and you want to ask it again, just click the like button and it means that we can see if there are particular popular questions to ask. So without further ado, I'm really excited to welcome Rick Vicaria, our first speaker, who's going to talk to us about the experiences of speech and language therapists in supporting the sexuality and sexual health of adults with acquired communication difficulties. Thank you for presenting on such an interesting topic and please begin when you're ready. Sure, thank you. So um, can you see the presentation there? Yep, yeah, great. Yes. Okay. So um, thank you for joining this presentation titled What Sex Got to Do With It? Exploring the experiences of speech and language therapists or SLTs in supporting the sexuality of adults with acquired communication difficulties. So sexuality in this instance is a term that encompasses areas such as sexual health, intimacy, dating, consent, relationships, etc. The data presented here today is derived from my um, MSE dissertation at Manchester Metropolitan University, um, which is supervised by Dr. Susie Willis. Um, it's going to be structured as per the following agenda you see in front of you right now. So the question I want to address really today from this talk is um, what's sexuality got to do with SLT? What aspects of sexuality and sexual health are actually relevant to us as speech and language therapists? Let's, let's explore that. So a partial inspiration for this project was um, a placement educator telling me that sexuality and sexual health are just a nurse's job, nothing to do with SLTs. So who's actually talking about sexuality in healthcare? Is it, is it nurses? Um, Diane Dasner, 2013, tell us that 60% of health, healthcare professionals in the UK believe that patient concerns around sexuality should be addressed in healthcare settings, but really only 6% actually initiate discussion around these topics. And McGraw from 2019 tells us that within stroke, failure to actually address sexuality with patients can lead to increased anxiety and depression and poor quality of out uh, life outcomes for stroke survivors and their, and their partners. McGraw from also tells us that SLTs have this unique ability to support people with communication difficulties when considering topics of sexuality, um, being able to communicate about it, be able, being able to understand it, all of that. The other inspiration for this project came from these two really fantastic SLPs in the US, um, Dr. Laura Walford, who works with communication disorders and um, sexuality, the intersection of that, and Dr. Ines Humbert, who works with the intersection of swallowing disorders and sexuality. And as you can see from that, there's a broad range of what SLTs have the potential to do for this area. Um, however, SLT perspectives within the literature are extremely limited in regards to working with um, sexuality, and even more so within the UK. There's a couple of charities that have some guidance around sexuality for, for patients for specific condition, conditions such as um, MS or for stroke, but they're extremely limited when you consider guidance around how to communicate around the actual topics. How do people with communication disorders talk about consent, about relationships, how do they date? What, there's, the guidance of that is more lacking. And when considering this, these are the research objectives that I developed for the project. So what is the extent of SLT's abilities and knowledge around sexuality from working with adults with acquired communication disorders? What are their attitudes towards the topic and what support do they need? So we'll delve into this a little bit more when we get into the discussion and results section. So here's a uh, kind of flowchart showing the IPA pro coding process analysis for the study. So IPA, Interpretive Phenomenological Analysis, difficult word to say, uh, it was chosen as the positive um, research approach for the study. And this is because it lets us have this ideographic perspective of exploring the unique experiences of the participants for this topic. So for a topic such as sexuality that is stigmatized in our society and has quite limited perspectives from SLTs within, um, within research. So as you can see in the sixth um, box there, um, bracketing the themes from each transcript before starting on a new one allows, allows the researcher, allows myself to code each one 
with a fresh pair of eyes before looking at the connections from themes between each transcript, between each interview. Um, so here's an overview of the six participants that were in the, in the study. Um, so participants were recruited with the following inclusion criteria. They must be a qualified SRT currently in practice in the UK and must currently be working with adults with acquired communication disorders. Newly qualified SLTs and participants with specialist knowledge in sexuality and sexual health were excluded. The first was because of possible lack of experience and the second was because of impossible access of experience in this area. It was important to gain like a realistic view of SLT experiences and working with sexuality without skewing the data towards one side or the other. So as you can see here, the six participants are quite a range of uh, lengths of practice and areas of practice. And this gives a nice broad range of experiences to the data within the study. And from that, the coding process gave us this. This is quite a nice overview of the five main research themes that came from the participant interviews, from the semi-structured interviews. Um, and you've got the sub themes for each theme underneath them, as you can see. At the top, you see the three research objectives that I already uh, mentioned earlier in the talk. And they're color coded to help understand which sub theme answers which research objective. So for example, lack of education under knowledge of working with sexuality is answering the objective of knowledge of diversity. Discomfort under stigma around working with sexuality is green, so corresponds to attitudes, et cetera. So we'll discuss this a little bit more further in detail over the, few, the next few slides. So the first research theme is knowledge of working with sexuality. And SLTs in the study discussed actually being unaware of the relevance of sexuality within healthcare until concerns emerged around the patient and when that kind of, yeah, when the worries emerged. And that let them feel underprepared and undertrained and just unsure what to do. So these experiences are corroborated by Lowe and All 2022, which identified that SLTs actually demonstrated the lowest level of knowledge around working with sexuality and stroke compared to other professions such as nurses, doctors, physiotherapists, and OTs. And there was discussion from the participants in this study around developing clear frameworks and methods of questioning, as you can see from participant E, um, to support in answering these potentially difficult questions and having these difficult conversations. So example from Go and, Grow and All, uh, 2015 in Canada, um, they added a visually supported short question around sexual health into their case history form that was already existing for the team. Um, and for them, sexuality was addressed within 100% of patients by month nine of their project. And there was no instances of harassment or unintended negative effects that were reported by the team. So the next one we're looking at is understanding of responsibility. So as I identified just now, sexuality is often only discussed by teams when concerns emerge regarding patients. That's, that's something that came out of the, um, the interviews from, from participants. And for them, it was difficult to define which healthcare professional actually had responsibility for working with sexuality. Is it physios, is it OTs, is it doctors, is it nurses, is it SLTs? So example that came up in the interviews um, that I had for this pro uh, project was um, an SLT talked about a globally aphasic patient that they worked with that was experiencing sexual abuse. And healthcare professionals on the team were hesitant and kind of unsure about taking on the responsibility of supporting this when they didn't have the knowledge or training to do so. And because they had communication difficulties, it just kind of fell to the SLT. SLT didn't really have any training on how to actually support this. So, so where does it go? So the SLTs in the study also discussed the benefit of collaborative professional working and training and highlighted this. And they also highlighted supervision and shared responsibility on decision making to be quite important in providing confidence for discussing these topics with patients. So the next thing we're looking at is supporting communication. So participants in the study identified multiple areas where they could provide support for SLT, as SLTs for communication around sexuality. So this included dating, sexual abuse, sexual health, understanding changes in someone's body, in the patient's body. And it's a big one, talking about consent. So how can someone give consent to sex if they have capacity to do so, but are unable to communicate their consent effectively? And how do SLTs actually support them in giving consent? What can make it difficult to support communication in this area around sexuality as SLTs? There's currently no guidance for SLTs in the UK from RCSLT towards the responsibility of UK SLTs in working with sexuality for acquired adult conditions. So the RCSLT has given us this quote, the RCSLT does not currently collect data of this nature. 
Um, and SLTs were kind of, as SLTs were kind of working towards a more equitable profession that's con constantly developing as our responsibilities, as our social responsibilities, our political responsibilities develop. And ev evidence-based research and varied needs of patients should be at the center of our work. So there can be barriers to this, of course, sometimes. For example, um, having a keynote speaker at a conference like this morning, who's a politician who's voted against LGBT rights, against human rights, against the rights of healthcare workers to strike, against voter uh, voted for stronger enforcement of the laws against migrants and asylum seekers. So this is a conflict, for example, that emerges with our aims of developing as an evidence-based patient-centered profession. And that can affect development of the profession in working in new areas like this. And as we know, Prejudice towards LGBT people isn't just present in politics, but can also be present in healthcare settings. SLTs in this study identified that lack of experience work, um, in working with LGBT people can, can create additional barriers when supporting communication around sexuality. And this is supported by Hancock and Haskin 2015. So we're looking at patient identity now. And what emerged from this, from these interviews, is that working collaboratively with the patient around their goals of sexuality, as participant F kind of discusses a little, um, using a biopsychosocial framework and not making assumptions towards the patients or center them in their experiences and in their identities and center those things within their rehab journey and goals. And this is supported by Peterson all 2018. So sexuality, sexual health, dating abuse, they're all topics that can cause discomfort for us as healthcare professionals. They're difficult conversations especially when the training isn't in place to support this. Um, we're looking now at stigma around sexuality. That's the theme. So discussions around sexuality were expected by participants to produce discomfort for the SLC, for their colleagues, for the family and for the patient. However, Zhang and all 2020 has a different view on this. Patients in that study reported that they have less embarrassment around discussing sexuality than HCPs and healthcare professionals. And they view it as an important aspect of their care, where they're just kind of waiting for the professional to start the conversation. Setting goals around sexuality as an SLT using this biopsychosocial approach allows therapy to actually be truly functional and reflect what the patient's day-to-day -day life and day-to-day -day goals are within rehabilitation. So what's the implications of this study within practice? So there's a need for clear evidence-based guidelines on working with sexuality within SLT for adult acquired conditions. There's a lack of availability of appropriate resources around sexuality, including visual resources. And participants weren't sure about how to seek support around communication and sexuality when these situations with patients occur, and by then it's almost too late for them, for the, for the SLTs. The benefit of collaborative MDT working and person-centered goals was highlighted, and there was this understanding that sexuality is not just a single profession's responsibility, but is more a shared res responsibility. Stigma and embarrassment were still expected by SLTs, however, but the literature gives us a different perspective on this. This is, this is something to explore further. So the presentation started with the following question. What aspects of sexuality and sexual health are relevant to the SLT profession? And this slide shows all the areas of sexuality that were identified within the study by participants to be relevant for SLTs to support. So the last question for you all is if you are having difficulties with your communication, which of these topics would be important for you to be able to communicate about? And how could SLT support that communication? So thank you for your time. Uh, there's a QR code in the corner there that links to a complete reference list that we that was used for this project. Um, and in the middle is ways to contact for any follow-up discussions you'd like to have. Um, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. I think you might be muted, Carolyn. Yeah. Thank you. I was just saying, really, really interesting presentation and, and fascinating to hear that it rose from a single question and, and drew to all of those areas. Thank you so, so much. Um, so as Rick said, any questions, uh, put them in the Q&A box or um, you very kindly put your details on there to contact thereafter. So thank you again. Thank you. Okay, next we have a fantastic presentation considering socializing in an online versus in-person aphasia ca uh, cafe. Um, so please welcome Sean Abel and Andrea Horgan to share their research. Thank you.
hopefully you can see that. Can I get someone to confirm that? I can't see it yet, Shona. Okay. Oh, I think like something's coming. loading. Yeah. Fantastic. So, I'm Andrea and I'm here today with Shona and co authors on this study, along with our supervisor, Dr. Harlan Kelly, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. So, I'm going to start off today and give you a little bit of background about our study. So, the psychosocial implications of living with aphasia are commonly discussed and include, but aren't limited to, social isolation, poor self-perception and loneliness. And quite strikingly, the incidence of depression in people with aphasia is between 62 to 70 percent, which is markedly higher in those than those without aphasia following a stroke. And this can result in people with aphasia recruiting from socialising and engaging in quite fewer social activities than their non-aphasic peers. So friendships and meaningful relationships play quite a significant role for people with aphasia and as we know from the well-documented research has quite a positive impact on them. And studies which explored both in-person and online peer support groups for this population have identified the benefit of groups in allowing people with aphasia to establish social connections but also practice communicating with those who've been through similar experiences. And additionally, peer befrienders with aphasia cite their role as not only enhancing the quality of life of other people with aphasia, but also their own. And a 2020 study also further identified the benefit of online social groups and enhancing that quality of life for people with aphasia. So, like everything at the time, the COVID-19 pandemic and social connections were incredibly limited resulting in people resorting to online for options to socialize. And we're all well too familiar with the challenges associated with communicating online, even a few of us had difficulties getting onto the call this morning. And um, the online interactions can be even more challenging for people with aphasia, with 64% identifying their aphasia as a barrier to either learning new or enhancing previous technology skills. And although technology does offer increased opportunities for socialising, communication and ongoing support is to ensure that it continues to be accessible for people. So let me tell you then a little bit about the Aphasia Cafe. So the known benefits of social engagement for people with aphasia and the lack of available resources led to the establishment of this informal conversation group back in Cork in Ireland. So the Aphasia Cafe was first established in 2017 by SLT student at the time, Rachel Boland and Dr. Helen Kelly. So prior to the pandemic, this cafe took place once a month in a local cafe, acting as an informal social environment for people with aphasia. So it was obviously very important that the cafe was fully accessible for people with aphasia and some of those supports uh, that were available are listed on the screen here. But as a direct response to the restrictions associated with the COVID-19 pandemic, the service then moved to taking place online and took place twice monthly over Zoom and actually continues to do so at the moment. So these are just a few images from the opening day of the cafe back in 2017. So the aim of our study then was to investigate the experiences, knowledge, attitudes and beliefs about the Aphasia Cafe, be that in person or online, from both the perspectives of people with aphasia, but also the SLT students who attended the cafe and supported them. And our research questions are listed on the screen here. Due to time, I'm not going to go through each of them individually. I'm now going to hand you back over to Shauna and she'll take you through our methodology and discussion. Can't hear you, Shauna. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Perfect. Am I right in saying that the presentation is gone or can you still see it? Presentation's gone. Okay, let's try this. Again. Okay, can I get someone to confirm if you can see this? It's just loading up now. There it is. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, perfect. And then, so, we felt were important in our study design. First is the phenomenological underpinning. 
which is commonly used in aphasia research to understand the unique participant experiences. The second is a multi-perspectival design, which combines two or more focal perspectives to capture the experiences of directly related groups that are involved with the same phenomenon, but they likely have different perspectives on it. So the two groups that we had involved in this phenomenon, which was the aphasia cafe, were people with aphasia as student SLTs. Both the aphasia and student SLTs were recruited through social media. People with aphasia were also recruited through the aphasia cafe, where they were given a brief description of the research and provided with an aphasia accessible information sheet. Student SLTs were also recruited through a student mailing list and provided with a copy of the information sheet as well. People with aphasia and students were considered eligible according to the criteria here on screen and they were provided with aphasia accessible consent forms upon agreement to take part in the research. So here we just have some examples of the aphasia accessible sheets and forms that we used and these were adopted from templates that were taken from the collaboration of aphasia trialists. So for both groups of SLT and individual interviews with people with aphasia were facilitated either by myself or by Andrea. As the research took place during the pandemic lockdown, video and audio recorded data collection were conducted online. The approach here optimised online safety, so each participant had a unique meeting code and each meeting was locked upon entry. Participants engaged in an informed consent process again at the beginning of the meeting and they were made aware that they could pause or withdraw from the study at any point and they could remove the recordings up to two weeks following the interviews. Participants were also given the option of completing interviews over more than one session if they felt they needed to, and participants with aphasia were provided the option of carrying out the interview with the caregiver present. Each interview was conducted in line with a pre-established topic guide as well. So we analysed this research according to Gail et al's framework ethics. We followed the seven steps that are on screen. I'm not going to go through these in detail, just in the interest of time. But the one thing that I do want to really stress is that we want to maintain reflexivity throughout this research. So we create opportunities throughout the research process for us to pause and reflect uh, and examine our own biases and predispositions. We carried through this uh, by using reflexive journalists, peer debriefing sessions and independent coding prior to the framework development. So here's a brief breakdown of our participant characteristics. Three people with aphasia participated in the research, four of whom were male and two of whom were female. Participants were between one and six years post-stroke, and participants were aged between 38 and 69 years, with a mean age of 53 years. One person with aphasia had attended both the online and in-person aphasia cafes, three had attended the online cafe only, and two had not attended either cafe. 16 SLT students participated in this research, all of whom were female and in the final two years of their studies. SLTs were aged between the year, uh, 20 years and 29 years old, with a mean age of 21. Five students had attended both the online and in-person aphasia cafe, um, five had attended the online cafe only, and two had attended the cafe in person, with four not having attended any iteration of the cafe. So the themes here relate to people with aphasia are outlined in blue and the themes that we found relating to students are outlined in red. As you can hopefully see illustrated here, the themes observed included reflection on socialising changes during COVID-19, awareness and purpose of the aphasia cafe and comparing the in-person and online aphasia cafes. People with aphasia also provided a description of their optimal aphasia cafe. So on screen you're going to see a small selection of quotes from participant interviews where quotes from people with aphasia are represented in blue and quotes from the student SLTs are represented here in red. The first theme which arose for both data sets was socialising changes during the COVID-19 pandemic. Participants noted reduced opportunities to engage with services and social activities, significant changes to socialising behaviours due to pandemic restrictions and an increased reliance on technology in an attempt to maintain social connection. The second theme which arose for both data sets was awareness and purpose of the aphasia cafe. Participants discussed how they got involved in the cafe, previous experiences at the cafe, the importance of a social outlet for people with aphasia and evolving social dynamics within the cafe. Our third theme outlines the comparison of the in-person and online cafe, specifically under the sub-themes of accessibility, timing and social environment. 
Finally, people with aphasia were asked what they envisioned to be the perfect aphasia cafe. And you can see a huge variation from person to person within this theme. So what did we learn from this data? Well, in general, both cafe configurations brought distinct challenges for both people with aphasia and for SLT students. The cafe was identified as a unique and important social outlet, with the online cafe being particularly important during pandemic-related social restrictions. The in-person cafe better lent itself to smaller and one-to-one -one interactions, while the online format can potentially hinder the authenticity of the conversation. But being online also reduced the pressure of participating, and it allowed people to ease into the conversational space at their own pace, while also increasing or accessibility for participants. People with aphasia expressed experiencing a sense of community in a space that was designed specifically for them, where they could exchange stories and learn from other people with aphasia. This aligns with previous research that reports that peer befriending is a rewarding experience for people with aphasia, with a positive impact on well-being and supporting people in coping with their difficulties. The Aphasia Cafe presents an opportunity for people with aphasia to expand their pool of conversational partners and it positively impacts the quality of life, not only for the person with aphasia, but also for the caregiver. SLT students find benefit in the opportunity to practice their clinical skills outside of that high pressure, high pressured clinical environment, but they often reported feeling the need to fill a more professional role, despite this being an informal cafe. This also lines up with previous research, which reported that trainee clinicians maintain a more professional persona in aphasia therapy groups for fear of their competence being called into question. SLT's perceived uh, technology as a dominant barrier to accessing the online cafe, whereas actually only one person with aphasia proposed this as a potential hurdle for people with aphasia. This shows the importance of not making assumptions about the abilities of people with aphasia, particularly as aphasia is only one potential influencing factor in digital engagement. Evolving group dynamics over time allowed people with aphasia to take more ownership over the cafe. So initially, conversations at the online cafe were student-led, with SLTs taking the role of the befriender and people with aphasia taking the role of befriendee. But over time, a noticeable shift was observed by people with aphasia and by SLTs, where the more seasoned cafe members transitioned from befriendee to befriender. This comes back to the research that Andrea mentioned at the top of the presentation, which found that relationships between people with aphasia can be very mutually beneficial. So what is the take home message from all this? Well, optimizing mental health and well-being was identified as an aphasia research infrastructure priority by CATS. Given the established link between social communication and mental well-being, a larger number and variety of informal communication groups such as the CAFE should be established. When asked to imagine the aphasia CAFE, the optimal aphasia CAFE, no two participants describe the same vision. Broader configurations of the cafe would allow different conversation groups to cater to different social needs of its stakeholders. One cafe cannot be all things to all men. So, like all studies, ours isn't without limitations, and these include the fact that our findings were completely influenced by the COVID-19 pandemic and the prominence of technology to facilitate socialising at this time. At the time of the study, both Sean and I were directly involved with the Asia Cafe and therefore participants may have been reluctant to give us any negative um, opinions. And given that our study was carried out online, unfortunately any participants without internet access were excluded. So, Further research should endeavour to include a great number of people with aphasia to increase the reliability of our findings. Additionally, further research should consider including the perspective of caregivers or family members to hear their voices regarding that social space. And finally, future recruitment of participants should aim to include those with internet access to ensure that this cohort is actively represented. And we'll leave you today with this final quote that one of the and that's you can't be and should not mind emails down screen here if you get in touch and thank you very much for listening.
Thank you so much, Andrew and Shauna. That's certainly a topic that will resonate with a lot of us on the call today um, and really interesting to the variation of what people would like in their optimal aphasia cafe. Thank you for, for presenting today. I'm aware that we've had a couple of technical difficulties. Uh, I've asked if there is any support on that or anything. and I'll let you know if there's any messages um, that I receive back, but to remind the recordings will be available um, and I, I'll let you know if I hear anything with regards to the technical problems um, during that. But thank you so, so much. And, and I think for the most part, everything came through really, really clearly. Thank you. Okay, so now we're on to our final presenters for, for this session. So I'd like to welcome Erica Mangialadi and Elizabeth Allen, who are sharing with us the implementation of an intensive comprehensive aphasia program in an NHS community setting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Caroline, do you mind um, allowing me to share? That's fine. You should be able to go ahead and share um, and I can let you know when it's coming up on our screens. Um, no, I can't. <laughs> if you can allow me to share as you did before, because I didn't have the icon. Should be able to. Do, 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 do. The um, small square icon in the middle. No. I, I don't have it. So. Is that coming up for you, Elizabeth, at all? No, I don't have it. Okay. Um, you are welcome to send it through. I will just ask for our IT support on that because they fixed it before. Um, there's nothing additional setting wise that I can add for sharing. Let me see. Apologies, we'll just pause for a moment or two and, and if anyone's thinking of any questions to put in the Q&A, now's probably a good time to, to pop them in. So, I had a window popping up earlier, but I, I, I don't see that now, I thought you did it. No, that was actually our IT team that I'm just contacting now and I've let them know it's as urgent as possible. Okay, sorry. No problem at all. I need to say sorry. Mm. Is there anything happening for you there, or uh, I've just yeah. tried some other things? Yeah, now it's working. Lovely. Mm. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm Libby Allen and I'm co-presenting with Erica Mandeladi today on the implementation of a pilot bike map in our community team. So research around aphasia rehabilitations um, shows that the more hours of therapy we offer to our patients, the larger gains we see in language recovery. 
In terms of dosage, lefetal suggested we should offer around 100 hours of therapy. Bregetal should say, um, say that they we should uh, we should offer around 50 hours but if we offer less hours this results in no significant changes in functional communication also each domain of the SEF model should be addressed in order to offer a comprehensive and holistic intervention program and uh, as we know for us that we work in the NHS this target is quite far for what we can offer to our patients where sometimes is only about eight hours of therapy um, the efficient way to deliver such a high doses of therapy is um, including an ICAP um, within um, the NHS setting, for example. And we know that this, uh, for example, six published papers around ICAPs um, have shown um, significant improvements in language recovery. So when setting up our ICAP, we identified a number of inclusion criteria, which were based on those used in previous published ICAP studies, as well as information taken from Queen's Square ICAP course, which Erica attended in 2022. You can see the inclusion criteria outlined on this slide. We decided to run the ICAP predominantly due to the size of our area that we cover to optimise participants' ability to access the ICAP but we also ran a number of face-to-face -face sessions, therefore participants needed to be independent for toileting um, and eating and drinking. There were four potential participants identified, however, one was excluded due to lack of access to computer or internet, and he didn't have anyone nearby that um, could support with access. We spoke to the three remaining uh, potential participants over the phone, one of whom was already known to the team and had received an initial block of therapy um, or 10 therapy sessions in 2022. One individual expressed concern over the intensity of the ICAP and asked if he could finish early if his language got back to normal, in inverted commas. Therefore, we didn't proceed um, to offer him, offering him a place on the ICAP as we had concerns around his intubation. We delivered our ICAP program over six weeks. The team was um, composed by two speech and language therapy students. We would have not made it without them. Two patients, Libby, myself, and our colleague Claire. In week one, the students had the time to familiarize with the initial assessments that Libby and I conducted prior to the students coming on placement. Then um, they, the students had the first meeting with the patients and they set up goals uh, collaboratively. And they also had time to explore the therapy interventions and resources that Libby and I put together. Week two to five, so four weeks, represent the core of our therapy program, where we deliver 50 hours of therapy, mainly one-to-one -one sessions. We also had group sessions and a museum visit at the end. We delivered the ICAP through a hybrid delivery um, uh, an hybrid method, where we mostly had virtual sessions and also face-to-face. -face. In week six, uh, the students conducted the final assessments. They um, got involved with the report writing and they presented the outcome of the ICAP to our special language therapy team. So we selected our assessments based on those reported in published ICAPs. And in addition, we felt that the comprehensive aphasia test offered a good overarching profile um, of each individual's language ability. We didn't include a quality of life measure. However, this is something that we'd like to include in future ICAPs. We adopted a formulation template, which was based on that within the Green Square ICAP, which allowed us to gather information on, for example, participation of, or participants' pre-morbid communication style, hobbies, their communication demands, and thus allowed us to form a holistic picture of each participant. Information gathered during these conversations was then used to inform the GAS goals for both participants. So this slide shows the profiles of both participants. Their language profiles were slightly different, with M showing impairments across each language domain, whereas J had a specific impairment at the level of the phonological output lexicon. They were both working full time prior to their strokes and both had families at home. Participant M identified four gas goals and due to his difficulty adjusting to life post-stroke needed more structured support to identify these than participant J did. Participant J identified three gas goals and as you can see both participants identified goals focusing on work as well as participating in conversations with family and friends. 
We deliver the evidence-based interventions, is one-to-one -one interventions and group interventions as well. Uh, for one-to-one -one interventions, we adopted um, semantic feature analysis, phonological component analysis, and also VNAS. And we put a lot of focus on um, interventions for um, uh, improving discourse and narrative. So we use the Luna approach and also more informal uh, interventions such as reading and writing emails and role play board scenarios. In terms of group interventions, we had a conversation group at the beginning and at the end of the week. And we also had a com communication partner training and a psychology group. We call the psychology group like Let's Talk About Us, just to have a more friendly name for the patients. and. We uh, involved the patients in an activity group where they had to plan a visit to the museum, which they really, really uh, enjoyed and appreciated. One of our um, patients did not welcome very well the communication part and training in the psychology group. So we uh, embraced his preferences and made reasonable adjustments uh, accordingly. So this slide shows an overview of the most significant changes seen on the CAT for participant M. The first column shows the initial assessment results, the second column the results at the end of the ICAP, and the third the results at the three-month follow-up. As you can see, scores at three months were either maintained or improved as for spoken picture description, verbal fluency, and writing to dictation, reflecting an ongoing improvement in language function. In the same way, um, this uh, represents results for patient J. As you can see, he made um, significant improvements in the post ICAP and also he maintained or made keep, kept improving in the three month follow up uh, for word fluency and naming and also for spoken picture description. He, there is a decline, I mean, it seems that there is a decline in uh, the three month follow up of the sp spoken picture description, but actually that score um, uh, is lower because it used less information carrying words. But when we look at the syntactic structures, the use of vocabulary, and also the grammar, we see uh, significant improvements in that. Uh, at the end of the ICAP, we collected feedback from patients and students. Uh, I'm going to read out some of the comments uh, that the, our patients um, gave us. So um, it, they said that they, at the end of the cup, they were more able to talk and remembering things. They enjoyed the presentation about holidays. Uh, they also appreciated the semantic feature analysis because they remind them of the category and they were able to think of more things. It, their level of confidence increased as well. So they were, one of them said that they were more, quite confident in asking questions in a worse scenario. And they were so able to understand a bit more, possibly speaking more than 18 months ago, and also the reading skills have improved. We received positive feedback from students as well. Uh, so um, one of the students said that he, the ICAP was an opportunity to work intensively with one patient and gain a deeper insight into their needs. They uh, both had the chance to use multiple approaches and to fail fast. They said that they're learning to adapt and be flexible. And um, they had now a better general understanding of aphasia and the different in interventions and therapy approaches used, which they weren't familiar with before the ICAP. And both students mentioned that the ICAP was a rare opportunity to both witness and engage a patient from assessment to treatment end, and you do so with unlimited support. Something that I wanted to add that we haven't included in the slides is the reflection that Libby and I made um, at the end of the ICAP. And we uh, reflected on the fact that we really had the time to research evidence-based interventions, to develop resources, um, to um, prepare materials, and also to make meaningful plans for um, the patients. And this helped us to uh, grow professionally and also to improve and um, become better clinicians. So thinking about the implementation of further ICAPs within our team in the future, there were a number of factors that we needed to consider. Throughout the ICAP, we had the support of a locum, without whom the waiting list would have substantially increased, um, given the average of six to 10 new referrals that we receive each day. Additionally, we had thought that once the students were up and running, we may be able to schedule appointments with other patients. However, this proved to be more difficult than we'd anticipated, further increasing the pressure on other team members. Therefore, we put together a business case, which has just been submitted 
to increase staffing levels to support with the running of future ICAPs. And we're hoping that if funding is approved, we'll be able to run two ICAPs per year. We'd also like to involve other professionals, especially psychology and other MDT colleagues as appropriate in the running of future ICAPs. I think just in terms of the students, we felt it was really important for the students to be really interested in aphasia, um, you know, if they're participating in the ICAP, um, but also thinking about patients' expectations as well and making sure that they're fully aware, aware of what the ICAP involves um, and kind of being very clear in goals. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Libby and Erica. Really, really interesting and, and good to hear that it's being taken forward as well. Thank you so much to all of our speakers today. We've got, had a really, really broad range of topics, but also a common theme of thinking about things in a new way. Um, so lovely to hear from everyone today. Thank you so much. We have we have around 10 minutes for questions now, and I've seen some coming in. Um, just to answer one that's come in a few times about presentation slides, uh, we need to check with the speakers um, themselves to give permission to send that out. So I've asked our team to send out a notification to all delegates um, around where the presentation slides will be shared after that's been confirmed with individual speakers. Okay, so the few questions that I've, I've come in and do keep putting them in if, if you're able to. Uh, the first one for Rick, um, so someone's posted that you mentioned limited resources to support conversations about sexuality, wondering whether you found anything that was particularly helpful to support with supported conversations around sexual health, abuse, rape, consent, etc. Yeah, so I think there's some, been some good discussion already in the chat from what I can see. Um, there was someone who works in um, uh, criminal justice, I believe, who talks about a talking about sexual abuse, a support conversation. Um, I, I believe it is. So that that looks really interesting there. And also talking mats is something that was discussed and brought up in some of the uh, interviews and my projects as well. Um, but really, the difficulty, I think, was within acute settings, within community settings, there isn't as much of those resources available for, for SLTs specifically or for really healthcare professionals. And it's great to hear that in some other settings there are, but in the six interviews we had, there was kind of this common consensus of not being aware of, of resources really, if they, even if they did exist. But I think talking mats um, is definitely a place that's, uh, that has has emerged. And um, some, of the some of the kind of, uh, sorry, some of the strategies that were discussed were more strategies that the SLTs themselves had to make as well. Um, so formulating uh, like flowcharts, visual resources, um, but then also com the conflict of visual resources, talking about sex and balancing explicit discussions with appropriate vis visual kind of resources. That was a difficulty there too. Um, but yeah, um, from the study itself, we didn't have a lot of uh, visual resources or kind of support conversation tools that emerged, but it's great to see that there are some out there and have been able to kind of look into some some more since the project itself. Yeah. Thank you and thank you um, as Rick says to those who have posted in the comments with resources that they're aware of as well. Thank you. Uh, next question for Shauna and Andrea. Have you returned to in-person meetings for the Conversation Cafe and if not why? The second part to the question, would you consider including family members or partners in the study? Um, and this, this the person who asked this question has been running Conversation Cafe led by volunteers for about seven years and sees the positive impact on both the person with aphasia and the family or partner. Two parts to that question, I can say it again if you need. Uh, Andrea, I'll speak to the, the first part if you're happy to speak to the second part. Um, but we did put the question to the members of the group whether they wanted to go back to a face-to-face -face version of the cafe um, and overwhelmingly the response is that people wanted to stay online. Um, even though they felt that the quality of the conversation was better face to face and the interaction was better face to face, because the online cafe was so much more accessible, there was such a broader range of people that could come to the cafe and people with more severe needs and more severe difficulties. So people chose inclusion over quality, I suppose, is what it came down to. Um, and that's really why we wanted to stress when we moved online, um, a lot of people started joining that 
wouldn't have been able to join face to face. So people from opposite end of the, of the country. So Cork is, you know, located down the very bottom of Ireland, but we have an awful lot of people from Northern Ireland that would log in. And feasibly, there is no way that they could come down to Cork once every two weeks to meet face to face. So I think that was part of the, the reason why people really wanted to stay with the online format. And then to answer the second part of the question, um, we have had family members or friends attend the cafe in the past, um, but what we've found is they've kind of, I guess, kind of spoken a bit more on that on that participant's behalf and often other people with aphasia who were attending the cafe independently and who would struggle to get involved in the conversation found it even more challenging when there was, say, more kind of a dominant personality. Um, but if we were to carry out the research further, we would love to get the opinion of those family members and those friends who help the people even access online. Um, we've even spoken a little bit about running kind of a parallel group for family members, our caregivers, our friends, um, because often there's that third party disability that often gets overlooked in the research, but that's just as important. So we would definitely like to consider that moving forward as well. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, feel free to shout any more at us or email us as well. Lovely, thank you. Yes, I think if anyone um, has any further direct questions, there is the option to, if you click on any of the speakers' um, images for this um, presentation in the agenda, then you can send a, a direct message to them. Um, so thank you for offering that, Andrea. Okay, a couple more questions uh, for Libby and Erica. Uh, so, first one was the ICAP delivered virtually or face to face? It was both. So, we had um, it was predominantly virtual, but we had uh, the activity group, which was run face to face each week. And actually, in the end, we didn't end up, in, end up running as many sessions because one of the participants, um, unfortunately, mm -hmm called COVID in the middle of the um, ICAP. But um, we did do, I think we had one activity group at the start and then one at the end for the museum visit and the rest was then virtual. Thank you. And a few more questions on the ICAP. Uh, so how was the ICAP funded? So, so we were really- Go ahead, Libby, that's fine. I was just going to say we were actually really lucky because we had a locum in place already that was kind of covered that they'd been in situ um, to cover COVID back and then um, our manager very kindly agreed to keeping the locum um, whilst we ran the ICAP um, and was very much in for us running it so she was happy for us to run it as an ICAP provisionally and then said obviously if we want to kind of run it in the future then we need to apply for funding to do that. Mm -hmm. And some more people on the chat asking if you've got any more info on the ICAP course. Yes, actually, I so Nicole probably asked one of that questions. I uh, already put the email uh, address of the two people they are um, coordinated the the course. Actually, the, the course was delivered is delivered over two days. The first day was in October, and the second day will be in about two weeks. Um, so you can also join one of the two days without joining both, but you should email uh, and then ask for more information. Lovely, thank you. And then a couple more questions specific um, to the ICAPs that you were running. How many people are you thinking of having in each ICAP group going forwards? And what year were your students and how long was their placement? So I'm going to start from the last question. Uh, the student placement was six weeks, which fit quite nicely with our program because Libby and I had the chance to do the initial assessment before the students started. And then the first week was more about, you know, um, first meeting, we met the students for the first time. Uh, the student had the time to to analyze and look at the assessment we um, administered and also had the time to understand what the ICAP was and, and have a look at resources we put together. And then we ran the ICAP for four weeks. 
Uh, and then the, the, it was the final week where it was a bit of a debrief and time to write the final assessments and so on. So that fit quite nicely. But I would recommend if you want to run it to liaise with universities to find out if there is a way where the students can, you know, if you can find a way to, to, to work together and plan uh, an SLT, a student placement that would fit with your own uh, ICAP. That makes sense. Then, um, in terms of, so the ICAP requires quite a lot of work. So I think we did start with only two patients, but I think that there was quite enough. You have to make sure that there is at least one student and one supervisor in charge of one patient, okay? Uh, so depending on how many people you have on your team, I would probably go with, you, with this ratio. And then there was one more question. Um, I don't remember the last question. Uh, I think you've answered both of the ones that I put forward. I had an, an extra one, um, but I think you answered both of the ones that I put forward. Okay. Um, the extra one was, did you get improvements on the CCRSA as well as the CAT? So I think one thing that's um, just worth mentioning is that because we had different assessors doing the three month follow up, we, that, the, the results of CCRSA weren't gathered at that point, but I think in terms of beginning of the ICAP and the end of the ICAP, certainly for partic participant M, and I'll let you answer Erica for participant J, but for participant M, actually some of his scores actually went down. Some went up, but more went down than went up. And we kind of were trying to tease out why that might be. And I think it's that we sort of felt that actually his insight um, over the course of the ICAP actually went up and therefore, potentially his sort of understanding of um, or kind of how he felt in specific communication situations, actually his competent confidence went down a little bit, which was unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for um, participant Jay, his level of confidence uh, has increased and he really appreciated uh, working more like the intensive work on, uh, especially on the uh, therapy on work scenarios, which was his primary focus and goal. Uh, but yes, we we noticed improvement. Another thing that we we had many many people administering assessment, and I think uh, that's something that Libby and I reflected on. And it should probably be the, the same person who administered the the final assessment, or at least everyone should be on the same board, you know, on the, on the same boat to, to understand exactly how what questions to ask and how to ask the questions and especially if sometimes if you need to prompt or not prompt the patients um, so in order to have a more consistent uh, result thank you okay that pretty much brings us to time thank you so so much i can see in the comment section there's been lots of resources shared uh, which is brilliant thank you so much and also if there's any questions that i haven't managed to get to apologies for that um, as i say if you look at the speaker's bio or image on the agenda then you can send them a direct direct message if you click on there um, and uh, hopefully they'll be happy to answer any questions that we've missed but just wanted to say again thank you so so much to all of our presenters today really really interesting topics really broad range um, and thank you all for such interesting questions and resource sharing as well it's been a, a really good start to the day thank you so much thank you, thank you.